Hi and welcome to Midnight Cry, a program that is committed to speaking the truth in love. I'm your host, Stromal Gassane, and today we have with us Beth Grove, who will be discussing with us two subjects, that is motherhood and singleness. First of all, welcome to the show, Beth. Thank you for having me. Now, we've got quite a lot on on this particular episode. I think we're going to be talking about perhaps two things, even though they're quite related. Let me start off by asking you, does Islam ennoble or does it give a place to motherhood uh, in its religion? Absolutely. Uh, so does every other religion. And uh, Islam, this is one of the, the, the areas that Muslims and Islam really talk about a lot, uh, uh -huh. especially when they're talking about women's issues. This comes up all the time. And okay. what we, uh, we want to do today is just look at how um, your traditional Muslim scholars view it and how some of your modernist Muslim scholars view it. Um, and then look at why does Islam revere, mother, revere motherhood so much, compare it to Christianity. And we'll just unpack that a little bit. But so Certainly, Islam does revere motherhood, just so like Christians do. So it's quite fi favorable, but it's not any different than perhaps any other religion. Yeah, and it's, it's not something that Islam ennobled. You know, it was not what they brought in. It was okay. something that existed in, in any religion. Yes, yes. Uh, interesting, just the one little difference with, with Christianity would be Islam um, reveals man and woman, so husband and wife. Okay. Because what can happen sometimes is, for example, take feminism. Sometimes feminism can revere the woman so much that men begin to be mm. pushed down uh, or yes. the opposite where um, a religion can revere men so much that the women get pushed down yes. but Christianity is very balanced it's about um, the mother and father and we're going to look at that a fair amount in this episode yes so then I'd like to ask are there any problems with motherhood specifically when it comes to the Quran one of the, the struggles, I think, within Islam is that uh, because so many traditionalist scholars uh, quote hadith, quote what Muhammad said, um, and revere motherhood so high that it sometimes brings a problem into the equation. And I want to approach this from the view of Muslim scholars themselves. This is, this is my view as well, but some Muslim scholars ha have a real struggle with how revered mother is in Islam. It's not actually necessarily a Quranic idea, uh, and it's more comes from the traditions. Let me just uh, read to you um, one, one hadith, and it says this. Uh, some Abu Huraira uh, recorded a man asking Muhammad who had the greatest right on him with regards to kindness and attention. Muhammad replied, your mother. He said this three times. He was asked three times. He replied, your mother three times. And then he said, your father. Hmm. Um, actually, uh, uh, there's many hadith like this. There's another hadith that says paradise lies at the feet of the mother. This is probably a weak hadith. A lot of Muslim scholars actually are, are debating whether this is weak or whether it's not. And certainly, um, a lot of traditionists those take it and a lot of lay people so i.e. your average Muslim on the street who doesn't know much about Islam they really hold on to this particular verse to show it or this particular hadith to show that is one of the uh, wonderful things that Islam has done for women. But can you explain I mean what does that mean that was it paradise is at the feet of well, mothers? Well that, that is a debate if you look at uh -huh. discussion boards between Muslims they will be discussing, discussing what does this mean yes. but the general idea is that um, learn at your mother's feet or or revere her okay. if paradise lies at her feet. It's sort of a, a, a revering of motherhood. That's the general idea that comes out of it. There's uh -huh. debates about exactly what it means. Mm -hmm. We don't know if this is authoritative or not, but let me just um, tell you about a few uh, traditional scholars. For example, one uh, traditional scholar, Abdul Hassan, talks about how a woman's biological makeup is the reason why her place is in the home. Or um, there's a, a man called Doi from India, and he says this, that the Sharia lots of the work of managing the home and the upbringing and training of children to the woman. Now, I mean, as Christians, we'd agree with that, but not just to the woman, to the man and the woman. Mm. See, Christianity is quite balanced. It's to the man and the woman. But certainly a mother, a mother's natural instinct is to nurture. So Christianity would support that, but not to the exclusion of her being able to uh, not be able to have a role outside the home. And so a lot of traditional scholars say, look at her biological makeup, look at how she is. She is supposed to be stay in the home. 
And there is a verse where um, certainly in Surah 33, it, it encourages Muhammad's wives that the be they should stay in their homes. And there's a hadith that say the best places for women is in their homes. So this is an idea that is circulating uh, much around Islam. But there's some modernist scholars that have struggled with it. There's some sociologists, Muslim sociologists, who have struggled with this particular concept. For example, um, a very um, excellent Muslim writer called Fatima Brunisi, she talks about how there's a lot of conflict in Moroccan families. She, she's, um, she is a Moroccan. She focuses on the Moroccan situation and how Moroccan families, the, the biggest problem in marriages and what divides families is the mother-son relationship. And this is very important because many, many of my Muslim friends, I almost, not everyone, but many of my Muslim friends have suffered because of the mother-son relationship. Mm. Uh, one of my um, Muslim, I call him my brother because uh, they're my Muslim friend, they're like a family to me. And my Muslim brother has said, my wife must obey my mother. My wife must uh, uh, follow what my mother says. Mm. I love my mother more than I love my wife. Mm. And that is a serious problem in Christianity. We, we would have serious problems with that. Uh, but one of the things also, I'll just refer to some verses. Surah 4, 1 says this, Fear Allah whom you demand and the wombs. It talks about the wombs. It's very difficult to understand in the English. And a lot of Muslims interpret this as the kinship. So relating to the mother, the womb of the mother. You've come from the womb of the mother. And a lot of Muslims refer to this verse. Surah 31, 14 talks about a man um, that he must be dutiful to his parents because his, his mother bore him in weakness and hardship. Surah 17, 23 says, be dutiful to your parents. Um, and that's exactly the same as the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, Exodus, uh, excuse me, Exodus 20, 12 and also Ephesians 6, 1 says that to honor your mother and father. And that was part of the Ten Commandments, actually, to honor your mother and father, which is very interesting because up to then, in the, the culture of the time, you only honored the father. So when the Bible keeps talking about motherhood, it's bringing motherhood to the same position as the man. Mm -hmm. And that's actually very, very important. Not more than the man, not lower than the man, equal with the man. And so uh, what you find is that the theology of Christianity has a very balancing effect on the family. Mother and father are to be respected. And, and, and in Islam, you'll find that actually it tends to be the mother is revered so much to a son that it causes a lot of struggles. Surah 46, 15 says a man, and it seems that this verse is just referring to men, a man must be dutiful to his parents. Mm. So then it would make me ask then, if you're not a mother and you're unable to be a mother, if you're barren, mm. what does the Quran have to say about that? Yeah, that, that is a particular struggle in a lot of families. Now, this is not just a Muslim problem. This would be across Africa, Asia, Arab world, um, where a woman is barren and it's a lot of stigma on the barren woman. Christianity does not put stigma on the barren woman. Mm. And it's probably the only uh, religion that doesn't put stigma on the barren woman. Not that the, the Islam overtly does, but when it looks at marriage and, and it looks at family life, or it looks at the woman, womanhood is always discussed as a mother, as a wife, um, a, as someone who will have a family. The Sharia law talks about all the, all the way through about motherhood and about family life. There isn't really a place for the single woman, but also with barrenness. Uh, barrenness is, there's a lot of stigma and a lot of Muslim families, a lot of pain. And partly because you have these hadith, paradise lies at the feet of, of mother, motherhood. Amina Wadud says that often when you think of a good Muslim woman, uh, she, a good Muslim woman is a good mother. Um, as, as she talks about this, she has some real issue with this whole concept of how it, it pushes motherhood so high. And so there are, there's real pain um, in a lot of people who don't have children. Mm -hmm. That's a natural pain. But when society or religion begins to impose more pain, um, then it becomes very serious. And my question is this, that is a woman's identity really being a wife, as Islam says it should be, or is a, m a woman's identity um, being a mother, or is it knowing God? You see, in Christianity is about knowing God. That's where our identity comes. It says in Christ is our identity. Mm. And so the, ma the married or the single woman, there is no difference in Christianity. But in Islam and in many religions, there's a, there's a huge difference. And I think it causes a lot of pain for a lot of people in some religions. That's right. I think a lot of the times it's, as you mentioned, it's the person themselves who feels the pain. 
but it's quite wrong when those people that now are around and closest to that person that or that woman that's unable to have a child put pressure or make her feel as though she's somehow disabled mm -hmm. or because she's incapable of bearing children well that will just add insult to injury well, and that I can really put a person down and really uh, have them question why this is happening in their life and often enough that can cause someone to turn away from their faith or their religion because they feel as though they're inadequate and God hasn't blessed them with children. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case. I mean, in Christianity, we understand that we live in a fallen world and a consequence of sin, there are diseases and sometimes a woman can't have children for one reason or another. And it's not always the woman's fault. And I think that's where we need to be careful also because mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's automatically assumed if a woman can't have a child, then it's her fault. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it could be the husband's fault. Isn't that right? Absolutely. And there's a wonderful verse in Jeremiah which says, For I know the plans I have for you. This is God talking. I know the plans I have for you, plans not to harm you, but yes. to establish you. And, and it talks about that God has a plan for us. So if you're a barren woman or a single woman, and there's certain um, uh, desires that you have that you wish you could have, actually God has a wonderful plan for you. So mm. that's something that people need to keep in mind. Yes. And so then also if we can move to the next subject, does the Bible have something to say about singleness? Has a huge amount to say about singleness. Let me just quickly wrap up about a motherhood because I want to just zero sure. in a little bit in a little bit more detail about what the Bible says about motherhood, mm -hmm. but that moves right into singleness. Um, you have, I just want to read a, a number of verses and it just helps us have an understanding, an overview of how, how the Bible views use um, motherhood. It says in Proverbs 17 and also Psalm 127 how children are a blessing from the Lord. Mm -hmm. So they are a blessing. Of course, when you have a child, you don't neglect a child. Um, you are to nurture this child. So they are a blessing. That doesn't mean that um, there's not blessings if you don't have children, but certainly children are a blessing. Ephesians 6, 1 to 3, Proverbs 23, verse 12 says, um, children are commanded to honor and obey their mothers, which is quite interesting, as well as fathers in a culture where mothers were not not to be revered at all. Proverbs 6.20 says, mothers are commanded to teach and discipline children. That's very interesting. Mm. Uh, women's voice, women had no voice, certainly were not seen to be teachers, uh, or, or in, not in the biblical culture, but in the, in the culture of the time where the biblical people were moving in. And so that a woman is supposed to teach is very interesting. The Bible, the New Testament also reiterates that. Titus 2 fights to love them, to nurture them. Well, Islam would agree with that, of course, and so would many other religions. 1 Timothy 5 says mothers are to be a good model and a good moral standing. I want to make a point here. In this particular uh, uh, passage, it says mothers are to have good, um, a good moral standard to, to be a model. They're forbidden to be gossips, busybodies, idols, slanderers, and drunkards. Mm. And I want to make that point because there's a lot of Muslims, and some of you Muslims who are watching this, you believe that Christians are immoral people or are drunkards. And I want to just make a point that no, we are not to be drunk. The Bible is very clear that we're not to be drunk and that we are to be responsible for our family. Yes, we enter the world of careers. I have entered the world of career uh, in, in for my church. However, uh, I, if I were to be a mother, I could be a mother and I could enter the world of career. Therefore, we have the choice, but we're not to be drunkards, we're not to be idle, mm. we're to be busy, we're not to be busy bodies, as in gossiping either. Yes. And many of my Muslim friends said the problem with gossip in Muslim communities is horrendous, and the Bible includes it as one of the gravest sins. That's it's a very right. grave sin. Uh, and also, 1 Timothy 5 says the young women are to care for their elderly relatives. Now that's very interesting because if we are to care for our elderly relatives, it means that the woman is still very much connected with her family. So the mother-son relationship, which in Islam, the, 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 the husband gives um, a bridal price for the bride, the woman, and she, she moves into his family and becomes part of his property. And, and in fact, uh, it, it, many Muslims don't realize that the real core Islamic principle of a marriage is that he is gaining property. Muhammad said the best property in this world, and among other things, is a, is a wife. Mm, and so, the, sad, yes, yes, and so it's a property, but not in Christianity. And so a woman is to look after her elder relatives, which is very, very important mm. because it means she is still attached very much to her family. Yes. So if we move to singleness now, uh, what does the Quran say about being single? 
The Quran says very little about being single, and singleness is a huge issue because singleness um, in Islam, really in the core teaching, especially in Sharia law, and if you look at the Quran and the Hadith, is not really an option. And um, Ashka Ali Engineer, who is a, a scholar of Islam, he says this, Islam has very strongly opposed celibacy and monasticism. And the Quran talks about se um, singleness in the, in the form of monasticism, um, monks and monasteries, mm -hmm. which actually is, uh, is actually not necessary. The biblical view of singleness, I'm a single woman, but I'm not a nun. I'm not, a, I'm not part of a monastery or convent, um, but I'm a single woman. It's quite different. We need to make that distinction because the Quran mentions three four times about monasticism or, or, or monks etc and it, it because Muhammad was interacting with um, Orthodox Christians or Christians from sectarian groups so they weren't necessarily people who who followed the Bible at least they added a lot of traditions and these were the people that Muhammad had interaction with we know that he um, from Muslim sources that he met a Nestorian monk etc and so he this was his view of singleness and there is a verse in the Bible, in the Quran, that talks about how, and they invented monasticism, and Allah, you know, we, Allah, um, it was not our way, it was not Allah's way. Uh, and however, the Bible doesn't introduce monasticism. No, no. It introduces chastity, introduces singleness, yes, yes. but not monasticism. So I think it's important for us to make that distinction. And in fact, I mean, the Bible is quite strong about uh, this idea that people should not get married or there should be an order where people should not be married. I mean, uh, the Bible does predict that in the latter days, there will be those that will come about and they'll say, you should not get married. And that's not right. Yes, there's a verse I'd like to read that talks about um, monasticism. It talks about chastity. It talks about what will happen um, in the latter days. And yes. I think this is a helpful verse to look at. 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. And it says this, The Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon their faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected, it is to be received with thanksgiving. If you point these things out to brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Now it's just very interesting because what it's saying there is that in some teaching, in some traditions, um, in many religions, there's this idea where people separate themselves in order to be pious. And whilst the Bible teaches a singleness and chastity alongside marriage, um, it doesn't necessarily teach where you, on purpose, choose to go into a monastery type of situation and you would actually um, decide that it's wrong to get married. That's, that's not what the Bible teaches. It's not wrong to get married. Paul encourages us to get married and he says if you're struggling with chastity, certainly get married. But the idea of separating yourself and not eating certain foods, we know Muslims don't eat certain foods mm. um, because they're considered haram and they won't eat them. Uh, but the Bible says, I've, I've given you these foods. God says, I've given you these foods. We must eat these foods. And likewise, when it comes to uh, people saying it's wrong to get married, and we've seen in Britain there's been um, a media outcry with um, abuse of children because of convents and um, mon monasteries where people decide it was wrong to get married. Now, it's nothing wrong to uh, go certainly to um, a place of peace and quiet. I have friends in, in Britain who go to places of peace and quiet who will um, meditate, think on the, on the Lord, think on scripture. I have uh, friends who go to monasteries and they find it extremely spiritually refreshing. But it's the, uh, we have to make a clear distinction between seeking out to, 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 to be with the Lord, but not making a theology of non-marriage. Mm. And that's, that's the important point that we have to um, look at. Interesting, if you look at Islam, you'll find that uh, they have advice on, char on chastity, on how to be pure. And I want that, this is very important that we unpack this a little bit. Um, Surah 4.24 talks about how men are able to um, gain women and um, they can certainly take on concubines and slaves. And then in Surah 24.33 it says, and those who cannot marry should practice restraint or abstinence till Allah enriches them out of his bounty. So it's the idea that Allah will give a spouse. Um, it's something that will definitely happen. And um, we also know that in Shiite tradition, which is about 10% of all Muslims, uh, it talks about how basically um, chastity is not uh, an option, or as in 
uh, singleness is not an option, I should say. But in order to be chaste, um, and temporary marriage is allowed. That's why muta marriage is, is allowed in places like Iran. And um, temporary abstinence, but not long term. Um, there's, a, there's a Shiite tradition that says, prayer has been the, made the apple of my eyes and my pleasure is in women. And this is from Shia um, hadith. So Sunni Muslims wouldn't agree with that necessarily. But certainly it's this type of tradition is right through Shia um, uh, religion. That's millions of people who, who follow these kind of traditions. And so um, there's this idea that um, you can't be single. I've talked to many Muslim friends, and especially um, I've in talked to Muslim missionaries and Muslim men who, who believe that it's impossible um, to, to live honorably and rightly and purely as a single person long term. But actually Christianity doesn't say that. Uh, for example, um, in the Bible it says that God is a holy God. Um, and so God is a holy God, we are to be holy. It also says that in, in Romans 1, 26 to 29, it talks about the, the evils of the sins of the flesh. Um, in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul encourages um, singleness on, on quite a number of times. He says sometimes it's even preferable. And not because it's the best way necessarily, but it is God, um, God is concerned that our hearts are sold out on him. One of the best verses of the Bible that I absolutely love and it sums up the whole uh, commandment of God is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so the whole idea is that is the ultimate goal of a Christian. We are to love God with all our heart, soul and mind. Love our neighbor. And even the Bible says love your enemy actually and forgive your enemy and pray for your enemies. And so there's this whole idea um, through the Bible. The Quran has no, no concept of that. Un of that. Um, Allah says you are to uh, love, um, love just your Muslim neighbors, but certainly not to love um, outside of Islam. Um, in the Bible, um, in, when, t when Paul talks about singleness, it's the idea that be solely devoted to God. He doesn't want us to have any distractions like um, being a mother, being a father, being a parent. And so it's not that marriage is wrong, but that he wants us to long for, for God above all else. Yes, that's right. I mean, God is really concerned about our relationship with mm -hmm. Him. That's first and foremost, and that can be achieved whether you're single mm -hmm. or with your, or mm -hmm. if you're with somebody. Uh, it really makes no difference. But what is uh, important to God is the condition of our heart. And if we have a converted heart, a new heart, then that is the very thing that. Uh, will prevent us from sinning, from falling into temptation. If we still have the old heart, then regardless of marriage or not marriage, and in fact, those that are married perhaps sometimes can be more susceptible uh, if, they're not, if they're not careful. Um, so then, uh, you know, have single women been used by God you know, in His ministry? Well, you're talking to one right now, yes. so I hope I've been used by God. But <laughs> uh, so certainly, um, one of the my favourite um, examples or models is um, Amy Carmichael, and she went to India. Uh -huh. Amy Carmichael was a little girl who was born into a blue-eyed, fair-haired family, and she had brown eyes and dark hair, and she thought. Oh, why am I this way? All my family's blue eyes and blonde hair and she wanted to be like everyone else. And she was dark. She had dark eyes, dark hair. And the Lord sent her to India and she mm. actually had a ministry of rescuing temple prostitutes, girls who were um, used as temple prostitutes. She, that was her ministry to rescue them. Mm. And so God made her exactly the way he wanted her to do, to be um, for that context that she, that she was supposed to go to. So this is the main point in Christianity. God has a purpose for every single person and that, that can be married, that can be single. And God has designed us mm. the way we are for a reason. There are so many wonderful examples. Um, look at the Bible. Um, I, there's a couple of verses that have really helped me in my singleness. And there, there have been times when I have wanted to be married. And most single people would have that desire that is quite natural. But there's some wonderful verses. And I just want to share these verses with anyone watching this because whether you're Muslim or whether you're Christian or whether you're agnostic, um, only really the Lord Jesus Christ can help you in your singleness, help you in in your life, help you in your marriage even. And I think this applies to both married women and 
single women, these verses, and married men and, mar and single men. Proverbs 3, um, verse 5 to 7 is perhaps one of my favorite verses, and it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. And that's for married and single people. And whatever struggles you're having in life, that verse is a reality. Psalm 139 talks about we are designed, we have a purpose. Jeremiah 29, 11 talks God has a plan for us. Psalm 37 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. And the idea is we delight in the Lord. When mm. we delight in the Lord, now our desires might change actually when we delight in the Lord. And then, um, then the idea of, if you look at how many um, women are in ministry, 80% of, of Christian missionaries are women. Some of them, are, many of them are married, but many of them are single. And the singles often outlast the married couples because they stay there for life, dedicated to the people God has called them. So absolutely, yes, God has a role for singles. Beth, thank you for your time. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. So we hope that you've been able to see for yourself that this is a really important subject for God. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Please stay in tune of the very next episode of Midnight Cry as we discuss punishment of women versus sacrificial love. May God bless you.